That sure was good. Oh, yeah. <laughs> There's nothing I miss more up at Yale than a good old-fashioned southern cooking. <laughs> Think that lovely wife of yours for dinner tonight. Nothing like my autumn cornbread. Oh, we're glad to have you back home in the south, little mm. brother. Must be hot up there in the north in Connecticut, all alone, mm. disconnected. Mm. Those northern folk, it seems to me, are simply downright inhospitable. But I guess you do get to study with the great Evelyn Hutchinson. Yeah, Hutch, the pain in the rear end. I learned more from you than I ever could, that old curmudgeon. That old Yankee Brent is more concerned with the institutional politics than he ever was with the natural systems. For a PhD supervisor, he don't do much supervising. He ain't ever around. Yep, remember when you were a student up in Illinois? I was just a little kid. Sure. And you'd send me back things to do, like, I don't know, go out banding birds or counting tadpoles. Yep. But that was my ecological education. That and Pop's uh, encouragement for us to get to ride. I recollect you putting out a local newspaper for the neighborhood. Still have a copy up at the archives. Mm. Might be worth something someday, huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, Pop certainly understood the value of self-publishing. Why wait around for these infernal reviews when you can just write a book and say whatever you want? Yep. Good advice, old Howard Washington Odom. He did seem to have a way of spreading ideas around. Seems that's why he sent both his sons up to the northern universities. A couple yep. of southern vines up in them Ivy Leagues. <laughs> yeah, I do feel disconnected up north. Everyone's in it for themselves, and nothing grows up there. You know, Pop understood early on that nature and resources are all interlinked. Regions collected together, parts, parts of a whole. Now, well, he also understood the power of having a degree from one of them northern colleges. People just ain't very good at understanding interconnected processes, H.T. Look here, just imagine how this piece of cornbread got itself up on this table. All the ways that this cornbread is related to agriculture, chemistry, soil, and water. And now that we've eaten it, this here cornbread now relates to the microbes in my stomach. Mm. Gives me power to talk and think. Part of the energy is flowing through us both. How and where does a science begin? What produces those who would wish to produce worlds? Does science emerge from institutions or from the land environments and how these impinge on the minds of people? What would it be to deeply account end to end for the environments, the interactions, and the kin of a science of environments, interactions, and kin ecology? I think, I think where a person thinks <laughs> Um, it, I think that the, the kind of situated positioning of, the, of knowledge practices uh, matters hugely. And without ever even going outside the parochialism of the United States, if you think of the desert biologists in the Southwest or the importance of the redwoods and to the, uh, both the eugenic racism of Madison Grant but also to the understanding of um, the biogeography of the Earth um, in the, let's say, the collision of the Arcto Tertiary and the Sonoran Madrone and the you know the, the importance of the Sequoia nya, 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 nya. you see what I'm doing. I think that and you can't begin to understand what's going on without the Great Lakes biologists which are different from upstate New York, which are not the grasslands, which are not the sea islands off the Carolinas or the Everglades or 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 or. No, I think where the the place that a person thinks is most real, if you will, <laughs> Uh, is most significant for understanding uh, processes more broadly uh, is really tremendously important. The brothers Odom, Howard Thomas and Eugene Pleasants, grew up on a rural pa patch of tepid muggy land near Athens, Georgia, in the southern US. Their careers took place at the University of Florida and University of Georgia, respectively. They are unlikely figures attached to unlikely places, to have generated a branch of knowledge, the science of ecology as we know it. What is it about the swamplands of Georgia and Florida that would give rise to such ambitious ways of knowing? I think the, the interest in the, the coast, um, and, and looking at these landscapes that most people don't pay any attention to, or that they don't think are 
interesting or remarkable or, you know, we don't have great big snow-capped peaks and, <laughs> and uh, all those other things. So, so, but we've got, if you, if you start to look at it closely, you see the, the incredible biodiversity that there is. Their father, Howard Washington Odom, was a renowned so sociologist, a Southern regionalist, and a notable early white proponent of black rights. He instilled in his boys a way of looking at the world as a self-sustaining system of interconnected parts. It seems as if the very themes of ecology, as epistemological masterstroke and messianic promise, are also those of the Odom's fraternal relationship. Basic principles that they both followed, I think, came from their father. And this was one of the things that enabled them to talk with each other because they had the same background and very much the same ideas and feelings. Brotherhood, a quintessential model of interaction. A duality often thought to be mutually exclusive and oppositionally destructive, but as often, Fraternal antagonisms are creative, a kind of ping-pong eroticism which operates in the spaces in between. And what happens in between is profound. Argued and deliberated throughout the development of ecology since Darwin, oppositional doubles are inscribed in ecological thinking. Change and uniformity, instability and equilibrium, competition and cooperation, integration and individuality. Should we find it strange that there are family resemblances between ecology, the science of ecosystems, and the brotherhood through which it was developed. This evening, together, we invite you to live through and between these dualities, because, well, we already do. We shall orient ourselves inside the in-between, inside the network, within the dash, sliding into slashed openings that are created when anomalous co-constitutions are brought into relief. What is brotherhood, if not a model of pendulum-like contradiction? The competitive solidarity that maintains and destroys families, the violent repulsion of that which you are resembling but are forever and inexplicably without choice attached to, the tough love that is never quite as tender as parental love, the definition of self in the negation of another. Ecology is a born cybernetic science. Also holistic, it amalgamates parts in service of holes and feedback in service of management and control. For the Odoms, ecology became the science of ecosystems, multiscalar, biotic, and abiotic networks, linked together through cycles and flows, exchanges, trade-offs, trafficking, leading to a mechanical, hydraulic, and energetic, but also teleological nat natural history of the world, anthropomorphically proceeding from youth to maturity, from succession to equilibrium. We each have our doppelgangers. What is between our nature and what we are by conviction causes division or even dijection within the self. Jekyll and Hyde warring beneath the strange social pressures of consistency, specificity, and clarity. Charles Darwin, for his part, was a difficult guy to peg. Did he view life as either rapidly competitive or chaotic, or as kindly harmonious and collaborative? He existed, it seems, in this in-between, his very lifestyle joining the pastoral existence of worms and pigeons at Down House in Southeast England with the competitive professional life of London embattled in an academic and institutional conflicts. It is, it is with similar ambiguity, similar resistive swings back and forth, that we chart a personal history of natural ecology through the relations of two white men as opposed to black, from the south as opposed to north, as opposed to separatist, as opposed to integrationist, as opposed to individualist, as opposed to mutualist, as opposed to competitivist, as opposed to harmonious, Teaching science to these kids without teaching them the human endeavors, economics, it's just absurd. Biology, zoology, segregationist, isolationist, supposing that species live separate lives. There's just no way working at a species or a gene level that we're ever going to understand relations. The Institute of Radiation Ecology will study the interdependent nature of ecosystems. As the first and only research institute of its kind in the world, the group will be a singular and world-beaten entity. 
a harbinger of cutting-edge research to come. Led by Eugene Odom, Ecological Society of America president and author of The Fundamentals of Ecology, the only ecology textbook to exist in the English language for over 10 years after it was first published in 1953. Research conducted at the New Institute will be singularly original. Developing ecosystems theory as fundamental to ecology as a discipline, rigorously systemizing the interrelations of living things as they proceed toward homeo's static climax. Everything is connected. Propping up humankind outside of or in contest with natural systems just don't hold up. Competition and mutualism are not mutually exclusive. Anyway, Competition is a form of mutualism. You need a competitor in order to compete. <laughs> oh boy, it does recall me of Gene and I. We drive each other forward in a way. Hell, we drive this dang science forward. We may very well share the same family name, but I'll be damned if I allow him to take any more credit for my ideas. Should have had my name on the cover of that ecology textbook. I wrote practically all them chapters on energy and population. I know he's important, but do we have to name check Hutchinson on every application we write? That man's not a naturalist. He's a technologist. And when I was finally invited up there for a lecture, they said I sounded like a southern preacher. There's complex changes between brothers. There's a need for us to hold together the best we can make joint contributions, reinforce ideas. Yeah, but there have been problems. Gene's interest in cooperation in nature never seemed to translate in his way of dealing with people. Lord, he's competitive. Anyway, collaboration, symbiosis, and interdependence are central to how ecological systems mature. And we must rid the science of this image of a Dog eat dog nature that is it's warlike, cutthroat. All right, all right. I'll mention Hutchinson, but briefly. There's no way we're gonna characterize these systems just toiling away at the species level or any kind of genetic determinism. Genetics always brings us back to selfishness, to competition and survival, individualism. Ecosystems don't have genes. You know, I should give old Howard a call. I just bet he's up on all this genetic stuff. As long as there have been attempts at understanding nature and our place in it, at their core have been tendencies to view the natural world as either mutualistic or competitive. Such natural system project onto personal and political philosophies. Why or how such guiding ideals articulate themselves in eco-philosophy is a continuous theme for the natural sciences and in the lives of the brothers Odom. Market economics versus communal resource management, the inevitability of capitalism versus the possibility of communism. Nature is also a justifying base for the nature of human beings. Underwriting how we organize resources, divide labors, constitute societies, punish, reward, and relate. In their private world of brotherhood, the Odoms were mutually competitive and competitively mutual. Their archived letters spanning an almost 50-year period include exchanges on everything from issues of scientific perspective, institutional politics, family interactions, Odom family land sales in Georgia, the health of their pops, Howard Washington, and mother, Anna Louise. Although they were highly and publicly supportive of one another's work, a parochial subplot trumped up by historians of ecology would plague their relations for years. Howard, at the time a young graduate student at Evelyn Hutchinson's PhD program at Yale, contributed two chapters to the incredibly popular and influential textbook, The Fundamentals of Ecology. Eugene gave no credit for these efforts in the first edition. I came to know Eugene Odom way before I knew anything about Howard Odom because it was his textbook that was the ecology textbook used at Colorado College when I was an undergraduate zoology major. Right? This, so this is I the knew famous textbook. Yeah. Odom overwhelmingly as the writer of a textbook that shaped uh, you know, generations of, of American students in, in ecology. And that, I think, produced a kind of parochialism 
uh, that was a very powerful, that institution of the textbook was very powerful. Eugene would credit the influence of Hutchinson, whose ideas were transmitted to him partly through lecture notes supplied by his younger brother. Hutchinson's relationship with Howard the Younger was never good, as competition, both real and perceived, developed between the men and between schools of ecological thought. Jean always talked about cooperation instead of competition, and cooperation in the natural world meant mutuality and symbiosis and that sort of thing. But everybody will tell you that they never met a more competitive man. With an eye towards promulgating their family name, their sibling relation could cause productive confusion. Quick readers of scientific literature might think the brothers' already prolific individual publications to be the result of a single author. It would not be correct to think such conflicted brotherly dialogues are rare originations of Western arts and sciences, bent as they often are on division and linearity, infighting and success as the succession of names. Bohr, Einstein, Jung, Freud, Nietzsche, Wagner, Van Gogh, and Theo, the Wright brothers. Such brotherly revelries formulate dichotomous worlds of white patriarchal thought, science as subsidiary offshoot of intellectually insular, or maybe even incestual bromances. We were walking out together and he says, well, my brother's coming to town. Um, he's coming to steal my ideas and, and go back and make them popular. The parlance of aggressive men constructs particular palaces of knowledge Intellectual duels one against the other can wind up erecting disciplinary scaffolding around us all. We seem to enjoy a few his stories as much as these confrontations of effort, a heated rhetorical contest, Socratic heads abutting, Edison and Tesla, always ECDC. Even, even when at their worst, the Georgia Bulldogs would play the Florida Gators every year and they'd call at halftime, <laughs> even at their, when they're so they were always, and they were, so they were always cordial. They, it's funny, they'd, they'd spark ideas off each other and H.T. would always be pushing and direct and Gene would rephrase more tactfully and they'd both, they'd, they'd hit each other with an idea, I mean it was, it was, it was great, it was fun to watch. Um, the Odom brothers understood that mutualism resulted in maturity, after which growth should be abated and things generally should just calm down. One part sibling competition, one part fraternal intellectual relationship, Odom ecology conceived of an energetics of nature and attempts always to maximize, maximize resource use through collaborative synergy, a dual system propagating itself for itself. The gentle southern brothers of Georgia, up against their heavy-hitting population and genetic biology counterparts from northern schools like Yale, Cornell, and Stony Brook. The most representative figures of these northern schools of ecology in the making were G. Evelyn Hutchinson, George C. Williams, and his progenitor, Richard Hawkins. Gene and, and uh, Hutch never had any problems. Hutch invited Gene Odom to Yale to give talks, even though many in the audience didn't really like uh, Odom. In fact, amongst the graduate students sitting in the back of the room, I, I heard people say just before Gene took the podium, it's Odom. How were the Odoms to be received? What would their legacy be? Did they realize how powerful the ecosystem's message they carried would become? Hello. Ah, howdy, Tom. Gene, good to hear from you. Good timing, too. I just got back from Gainesville for some work out in the Everglades. How are things with you, Martha and Bill? Good enough. Martha continues her painting, and Bill seems to be progressing well. Mm. You know, he may even be following in the footsteps of his uncle and brother. Hmm. What you up to? Well, <laughs> actually, have you read that new Dawkins book yet? Seems to be getting some attention. The selfish gene. <laughs> yeah, quite a thing. I got a review copy. Haven't had time to crack it open yet. The quarterly ecology review seems to think it's going to be a bestseller. But to me, they're a bunch of reductionists. 
Individuality, adaptation, simplistic subspecies Darwinism. He seems to be rotting his way into the hearts of the genetic biologist and the free market economist. They got themselves a new prophet, sounds like. Uh, just listen to this now. Mm. And I quote, Remember that we are picturing the animal as a robot survival machine with a pre-programmed computer controlling the muscles. Oh, man. <laughs> Unbelievable. And you know, Gene, all those folks up at Yale like to point out whenever they can that the ecosystem energetics are reducing everything to just physics, as if they weren't starting from exactly the same place. I think we've all got a bit of physics envy. They're missing the larger framework. They just can't see the forest for the trees. Mm. And Dawkins, Williams, Wyatt, all of them. They're just digging deeper and deeper into natural selection, competition, scarcity. The whole is more than the sum of its parts. It's the functions that things perform. That's what's important. Things adapt, evolve, sure. But once relations are in place, individual adaptations just reinforce the system. The rabbit jumps into the fox's mouth. Hmm. When I was up at Yale, I barely saw Hutchison. But he was definitely into systems. He thinks he can uh, rebuild it all from the ground up, applying constraints. Gene, that Macy conference stuff was all based on limitations and limits and minimal cybernetics. Old Hutch sees things as competing entities and struggling. Might be something in the water up north. <laughs> Well, as you know, biodiversity always increases as you head south. There's a lot more complexity down here in Georgia and Florida, the swamplands. The Everglades are a damn sight more entangled than some lake in upstate New York. Well, yeah. Simplification isn't always reductionist. Deliberate black boxing. That helps you see the overall effects. And this is what your whole macroscope seems to me to be about. What my time in military meteorology taught me is that knowledge really isn't useful unless it can foretell things in the future. We gotta try to work and work towards making models statistically or mathematically. Yeah, we, we can work on models, sure, but the future is being written all around us right now, HT. Not the moment to get caught up in academic debates. I mean, here in Georgia, we're up against folks who are threatening to dig up the marshlands for all the phosphor under there. We can't just loaf around counting butterflies and DNA strands. <sighs> Ecology, as much as we need to prove its worth as an objective science, is also, also about how we manage nature. MNG concepts point in that direction, Gene. Focusing on the accumulation and the histories of energy flows. Energy as a common functional order of nature. A key to bridging science and society, ecology and economy. Without this kind of thermodynamic approach, ecology could just lock up into arguments about whether a pro-climax precedes or follows the climax, whether a clan is more or less inclusive than a consociation. Hmm. Well, you know, we're teaching a new course in the fall here on energy. Uh -huh. Going to use the fundamentals textbook. We really should think about revising that chapter, by the way. <laughs> And uh, maybe add my name in the credits, say, eh, big brother? <laughs> hey, uh -huh. no time. I don't have time mm -hmm. to get into all that right yeah. now. I mean, hey, college is still in its infancy. You know what? I'm about to open this new institute of radiology, ecology, radiation ecology. The Atomic Energy Commission has opened up a whole bunch of opportunities. Mm. I mean, we can trace energy through radiation. It'll give us the resources to elaborate things like energy for years. I mean, with their support. In 1971, the younger Odom brother, H.T., wrote up a principle that he called the macroscope in a book titled Environment, Power, and Society. The macroscope, as juxtaposed to the microscope, would remove detail, not find more of it. The dial on this imaginary scope brings into focus various levels of organization from organisms through populations, landscapes, societies, all the way up and all the way down. For Odom's thinking, thinking about um, ecosystems in terms of scale allowed him to collapse the nature-culture binary. Um, so he was able to look at a forest next to a town 
and think about the energy exchanges that took place between those two things. So he could say, you know, these are the same thing at this scale, instead of thinking about one as a separate object from the other. With such an instrument, ecology could become a master discipline, fusing physics, chemistry, biology, and economics into a generalized theory. Ecosystems thinking integrates and manages everything, from a solar system to a planet to an atom. The Odom's gesture was double, attempting in the same moment to build an objective rigorous science in its own right, while positioning ecologists and ecology as a natural advocate of the ecosystems that they were studying. Ecology came to include the effects of human activity, a stance that can be readily hijacked, giving way to planetary management techniques, geoengineering. We had this uh, dualistic relationship with the world in which we understood that the world was out there and we could investigate it, and we were impartial, objective observers of an external reality. That's not the case in ecology. Against detached, cold scientific northern analyses, the Odom's relational and holistic southern environmental charm presumed systems and their integrity to exist in advance, like a family or relations of kin. Notions of family relations, wholes and parts, holism versus reductionism, like all dichotomous theories of nature, have ideological bases and effects. Contrasts between holism and reductionism map onto things like liberal and libertarian. Those researchers that Eugene Odom liked to label as reductionists supposedly saw interactions as inherently selfish, depriving ecosystems of their sense of direction. Natural history for reductionists is open-ended and additive, and complexity is generated through violent spurts of disruptive growth, an ecology of chaos. Odomites, as Odom's followers were called, would argue for a harmonizing and holistic perspective that implies progress and directionality. Ecosystems attempt to perfect themselves, maximizing energy, integrating and harmonizing. They mature over time. Organic communities are higher order forms that exist in advance. Their characteristics show up at the level of the system, but may not be apparent in and amongst individuals. A watch is a very good example. If I were to throw all the pieces out here, uh, of, from a watch, all the gears and the springs and the um, uh, bits, bits and pieces. Um, and I said, okay, use it to, to um, uh, keep track of time. Adaptation and Natural Selection, a critique of some current evolutionary thought by George C. Williams, is now a classic of evolutionary biology. Aspects of Williams' book were popularized by Richard Dawkins in his 1976 book, The Selfish Gene, writing that genetic segments can enhance their own transmission at the expense of other genes in the genome, took the neoliberal imagination by storm, naturalizing capital-driven competition. In contrast to Part's first population biology, the Odoms espoused a multi- and metascalar view that was more aligned to historical materialism. As Marx did, they trusted that eventually we'd all have to become grown-ups and stop growing so fast. Parts, always less important than the whole, testify to the Marxist leanings that inform HT's later work, attempting to evaluate the labor value of nature itself. <sighs> Wednesday. June 20th, 1954. Dear Jean, I received a letter today from the Autonomous Energy Commission, an official invitation to the Inuitok Islands. Well done orchestrating the project. In general, I believe you have a tendency to charge the poor government more than would be absolutely necessary. But I will follow your lead by charging them for time absent. The radionucleotide method works well and I have been introducing isotopes for the metabolism studies over the past months on the Evergrace research to good result. Since the nuclear test explosions are being conducted in the vicinity of the reefs, I think we have a really unique opportunity for a critical essay on the whole populations and entire ecosystems. Friday, June 29th, 1954. Dear Thomas, Thanks for your letter of June 20th. 
I enclose the Federal Bureau and Atomic Energy forms. Each need signed in and triplicate and forwarded directly to the Virginia offices before the end of the month. After clearances are granted, all that remains is to book passage. This will come after a week or so with the wives and families in San Francisco. I've received word that the AEC has just completed the rather ecologically named operations Greenhouse and Ivy. The blasts apparently vaporized one of the atoll islands, leaving only a crater. It's as if they're attempting to turn our island laboratory into its opposite. Hope there's still something left by the time we get out there. I've been studying the aerial photos the Navy sent. Our approach should be to the southeast. The coral is the perfect target species. We can orient measurements on the north and south aspects of the reef. You in a boat, me with my snorkel, and don't forget the ping pong balls. It would interest you that colleagues in Florida have asked about science ethics and atomic testing sites. We advance on a broad front. It's not unlike the advancement of an army, and a breakthrough may occur anywhere. When it does, it will not penetrate far until the whole front moves up. Ecologists shouldn't feel bashful about attacking ecosystems so long as they observe the rules of good science. What has your line on this been? We are in the atomic age, Thomas. The way radiation moves through flora, fauna, everything means we now have both the impetus for and the means of creating a holistic science. You know, we talk is just the tip of the iceberg. I'm continuing to build up the Savannah River site this summer. There are new energy commissioned bioecology projects at Oak Ridge, Hanford, the Colorado Plateau. We're building an invisible college that will catapult ecology into a veritable institution. I received an autographed copy of Hutchinson's new book and thought for one blissful moment that Hutch had forgiven all and uh, we were back in the fold. Then I got a note from Pop. He had the Yale University Press get it autographed before sending it to me. Father's influence pervades and persists, like radionucleotides with a half-life just about as long. Once the pressure is off all this hellish bureaucracy, we should find a moment to strengthen our plans. How about coming down for a couple days of conferences, a bit of tennis? We have access to the new Department of Conservation Board and can go out from Tampa toward the Gulf or from Jacksonville for fishing. Hmm. Family is fine. All have been well. Love from all. Sincerely, H.T. Bureaucracy is part of politics, getting along with other systems. And if ecology is to be a science that integrates human activity, it is both necessary and appropriate that we build up institutional structures and connections as part of our work. I thank you for getting everything to the AEC and the Virginia offices on time. The summer is overloaded with administration, unfortunately. If family summer plans develop, they would have to be late in the season, and perhaps we could meet part way. Otherwise, Christmas, before relocations and departures to the West, may be more sensible. We can plan the work ongoing. I'll give you a telephone call in the next weeks. Things good, but busy here. Family good, boss and love. Good enough, Jean. The Use and Abuse of Vegetational Concepts and Terms is the title of 1935 paper by the English botanist Alfred Tansley, in which he coined the term ecosystem. The title was also later used in the Adam Curtis documentary, All Watched Over by Machines of Love and Grace, which orients ecosystem as a me mechanistic theory of nature. What caught Tansley's imagination was an obscure theory that said that the human brain was actually an electric. One of the requirements of these new ecosystems was a need for them to be isolated, theoretically as representation and experimentally physically. Boundary conditions, the forcible production of black boxes, could create new mass scale testing grounds. Ten years before the first nuclear device was detonated at Trinity site, Arthur Tansley wrote, the point is to isolate ecosystems mentally for the purposes of study so that the series of isolates we make become the actual objects of our study, whether the isolate be a solar system, a planet, or an atom. 
The isolation is partly artificial, but it is the only possible way we can proceed. Ecosystem ecology would re-energize long-standing Western imaginaries of islands as laboratories of colonial science. The Odoms and other bioscientists were invited in the early 1950s to undertake fieldwork at Inawitok Atoll, part of the Marshall Islands, slightly west of the international dateline. This kind of work lured scientists with the promise of funding and the potentials of atomic science as a cure for cancer, a source of heat, power, new metals, new fuels, as well as new ways of nourishing ecosystem and, quote, correcting vitamin and mineral deficiencies in foods. The way they were sure that they were able to sample the water that had started on the offshore and got to their point on the inshore was they threw a ping pong ball in the water. And when they took the point as the ping pong entered the water, they took the sample. And as it passed the second uh, surveyor gene, usually, they took a second sample right there. And what happened in between was profound. By the time the Odoms arrived for their six-week study, 18 nuclear weapons had been detonated, the extensive radioactive fallout from which displaced and sickened thousands of Marshall Islanders, Japanese fishermen, and others in the Pacific Proving Grounds. The area is subject to an ongoing nuclear claims tribunal, ruling against the United States for damages done to the islands and its peoples, both now also threatened by rising sea levels. An over $500 million settlement owed to the Atoll people by the U.S. government has never been funded by Congress and remains unpaid to this day. Radioactivity is itself Janus-faced. As pollutant, it irritates materials and tissues, creating longitudinal malignancies, disease, and growth defects. Radiation also gives beautifully clear, traceable, and distinguishable signals. Nuclear weapons testing is both materially destructive and scientifically instructive originating at a singular place in time and leaving its indelible mark on everything. Ecology, like Anthropocene science, paradoxically creates the opportunities that radioactive pollution provides. Automite ecological studies of Fukushima, Chernobyl, and Mayak are currently underway. After the Inuitok work, Eugene returned to Georgia with solidified support and contacts in the Atomic Energy Commission furthering the activities of his radiation ecology laboratory at Savannah River Nuclear Site, two hours east of Athens, Georgia. Howard followed up by irradiating the El Verde tropical forest. While chief scientist at the Puerto Rico Nuclear Center, he would publish a 1,600-page, 114-chapter book known as the Green Book that characterized energy, species, carbon, and material transport of plants and animals while damaging and potentially destroying them. Oh, I've been super busy with administration these days. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a damn treat to get back into the lab. These coral polyps and the algae have achieved such interdependence. They perfectly illustrate how we might achieve symbiotic relationships between nature and humans. You've always been the more organized one. I finished up this electronic circuit. Look at this thing. This thing, Gene, is an analog model of the Everglades. If I fired this thing up, it'd tell you how many alligators would be in Southern Florida by the end of the decade. Ha! Wow. Uh, brilliant. Uh, well, by the by, I'm uh, finishing the ecology, a bridge between science and society, textbook for Senauer. And I was hoping to include a few of them diagrams you made. Energy circuits. Uh, we should publish more of them energy, energy stuff. Uh, they're fundamental to the communicating of ecological and economic ideas. And if OPEC keeps up this infernal oil embargo, there will certainly be a lot of interest in energy environment analysis. Mm. Ah, Gene. You do, love, you do love putting out a textbook entitled Ecology every 10 years or so. <laughs> and yeah, of course, you can use all the diagrams you want. Uh, here's one for the city. Hmm? And uh, yep, uh, here's one for the zealous religious movements. Uh, the unholy combination of religious dogma and access all. There's a lot of value in these. 
But it's important to remember that we understand them as provisional. They're really just thought experiments. The map is not the territory. Diagrams are powerful abstractions. Symbolic languages highlight and create new exchange value. I mean, it's all right there on the same page. Look here, sunlight, plants, animals, soil, energy, people, money. A diagram is not reductionist. It's wrought with multi-layered meaning. Like a poem. Yeah. A picture's worth a thousand words. And could also be worth a thousand barrels of oil. Or a thousand dollars, if you know what I mean, little brother. Yeah, I know what you mean. Well, I'll send you a few more diagrams next week once I get back to Gainesville. All right. Now, Gene, I think this maximum power principle I've been working on could also be worth writing up in that book. The fourth law of thermodynamics. Ecosystems always try to maximize energy use. That's what total energy of the system, what's that worth? What, how much money? From their early training as natural scientists and the influence of their sociologist father, the total picture of an idea as a diagram, model, or map was important to both Eugene and Howard. The thing about electrical circuit diagrams is that they have a well-established connection between a mathematical description and uh, their, the diagrammatic properties. You can just take an electrical circuit and write down its corresponding um, differential equations to describe how the, the electricity flowing through the circuit behaves. And Odom's idea was to essentially do the same thing and he proposed a circuit diagram which you could then directly translate into a set of differential equations, which was, you know, magic to me. Howard, the gifted one, was always devising neologisms, analogs, the most infamous of which was the circuitry, uh, circuit, circuitry language for ecosystems, or MRG diagrams. These diagrams, differently than text, express a particular kind of totality, a singular image resonating through many dimensions at once, like an electronic circuit, which is at the same time physical, logical, and algorithmic as an object. Odom's abstract machines alchemically jump off the page, changing the world they were developed at the outset merely to represent. And you could essentially simulate whatever you were trying to represent and see the results in real time on this oscilloscope, which was a, or a CRT, a cathode ray tube. And it was amazing. It, you, could, you could conceptualize the economy of the United States. You could conceptualize the ecosystem of Silver Spring, whatever you imagined. Of course, most of the time when you plugged it in and turned on the computer, it blew up. It is through such devices that mature ecological thought could thus become a kind of general ecology applied to industrial and informational environments, digital and market exchanges, a way to think and do everything, naturalized and therefore unavoidable, unstoppable and without alternative. Through the seemingly simple insertion of graphics for flows of money alongside material and energetic flows, the Odoms ambiguously implicate and connect economics to the natural environments that ecology was born to describe and even protect. From the late 1950s onward, Odoms and their research students would create a host of graphical rubrics, circuit diagrams and abstractions, which found their way into publications and books, but also trucker hats, coffee cups, rubber stamps, ties. Abstracting ecosystems in this way brings with it the possibility of, conversely, abstracting ecosystems as value, as money. Can a price tag be put on Floridian estuaries, entire marshlands, national territories, or even the oceans of the world. I was trying to figure out cultural values of the ocean, and I thought, well, how can you do it? And I thought, well, maybe you could figure out how many copies of Moby Dick are, are sold or read every year, you know? But then I thought, okay, well, maybe it's, maybe I could just, you know, the value of a sunset, you know? I think, in fact, Odom wrote a paper called What's the Value of a Sunset? Um, and I thought, okay, so let me call up some um, real estate agencies around the country. And so I called these real estate agencies in poor places like Alabama and rich places like California, and I asked for estimates of 
housing price values right at the seashore versus like a kilometer inland and said, you know, well, this gives us a rough idea. The real and perceived energy crises starting in the 1970s brought Odom style energy and environment economics to the fore, giving birth to ideas like ecosystem services, industrial ecology, and environmental economics. Howard Odom would eventually argue the possibility that free market mechanisms might be part of his fourth law of thermodynamics. Capitalism could simply be maximizing power by extracting and circulating as much energy as possible. Fossil fuels, so to speak, jumping into our cars, our power plants, our mouths, to make the system work. The black death of the sun driving petroculture towards maturity. Everything is connected. Flows of energy generate the ecosystems of the biosphere, including this phenomenon of humanity and its human values. What shall we make of the path that Odin brothers forged? Their contributions, ambiguously, perhaps unavoidably, were both for themselves and for the world. Their own energies poured into the science of ecology, succeeding and maturing as, as the ecosystems they promoted and defined. The whole is more than the sum of its parts. An examination of the laws and systems of interaction can show how human values are related to the ecosystem's energy flows. As the duo-dominant academic species in an entangled bank of Southern American exceptionalism, Cold War imperialism, and scientific opportunism, the Odoms created a feedback circuit that defined nature, ecologies, as ecosystemic. Everything and anything that takes place on Earth is a flow of energy provided primarily by the sun as it streams towards a pool of dispersed or expended heat. With the turning of the earth, everywhere within the light is a great breath as tons upon tons of oxygen are released from the photochemical surfaces of green plants, becoming charged with food storages by the onrush of solar photons. When the sun passes in the shadows, a great Exhalation burns, and the carbon dioxide pours out. During the day, while the oxygen is generated, a great sheet of new chemical potential energy as new organic matter lies newborn about the Earth. In the darkness, the organic matter disappears like firewood in a bonfire and releases heat through the night, joining the economy of society to the environment symbiotically by fitting technological design with ecological autopoiesis. The Odomite view, sublimely microscopic in the extreme, often veers towards an allegorical scientific poetics. With a black box so large, they threaten to obscure the very things they sought to protect. Ecosystems disappear detail, concentrating power in, um, at outputs and inputs, not within. Supply and production become terminal signifiers of health, welfare, and value. Energetic machinic renderings that make life containable, calculable, controllable, commodifiable. What we have together this evening created of this brotherhood, just as this brotherhood helped create, is caricature, sketch, diagram of material nuance and lived actuality. Two nodes of a system in feedback the Odoms wrought much more than their sum, doubling the earth as an ecosystem, doubling ecological value as economic value, we double count the world, while nature is required to double its productivity. The brotherhood of ecology, awkward and intricate, contradictory and ambiguous, is neither neutral nor natural. <laughs> 